it isn't simple remembering my journey to Israel. It's as though a memorial flame had gone out, leaving a flower in its place, a burning flower of hope. The moment we were off the ground in New York, I forgot hund and children and 16 years of living in America and became wholly centered on the scraps of what had been my life. A picture of Hans, my brother, as he was at 12 when he left us for Palestine. Another of Hans, a soldier fighting for our people there. And our beloved parents, one so happy and so good, now ashes over Germany. One thing bound me to the Hans of today, a map on which were marked the places I had helped redeem as a Jewish national fund chairman for Hadassah. My brother in Israel also worked for the JNF. We'd have something in common when we met, I thought. I was afraid my sister might not know me. I wondered how life in that fabulous United States had altered her. Our letters, always dwelling on the past, were unrelated somehow to our daily lives. Would she be a stranger? Would she understand how, while working to redeem the land of Israel, to bring back its forests and waters and ancient fertility, the land had somehow become mother and father to me? Would she sense with how much toil we have riveted the 20th century here? Would she feel the youthful vigor of the land? Would she love Israel as I do? Then as the plane set down and the passengers emerged, one face sought me in the crowd, separating itself from those of the strangers. Could that be my sister, that smiling woman waving there? First I was not sure, then something deep inside me knew her. It was simple. The homecoming of a sister and of a friend. Easily, as though there had been no years of death between, as though we had grown up together happily, as though nothing had broken the bonds, we met and talked and went together to explore Israel. Hans didn't know how strange it was to me, that ride to Jerusalem. The signs in Hebrew, Arabic, and English, too. The unaccustomed sounds. He never stopped talking, trying to connect with me, I guess. This is Lydia, he said. We fought a heavy battle here. Now you can see its busy town filled with newcomers. He pointed out the humming streets, the householders, the vendors of all kinds. He proudly called attention to a new cement factory boasting of double production since independence. Casually, he said, that's an olive grove. Then you're not listening. I wasn't listening. Those barren hillsides disappointed me. I don't know what I expected, but you see, in Hadassah, when I worked for JNF, I always talked about a green mantle carpeting the hills. I hadn't realized how stony they could be, how stark and silent. Then Hans, perhaps sensing my disappointment, pointed to the horizon, to Jerusalem, and gently asked, Remember how Father used to say, Next year in Jerusalem? It was hard always to keep remembering. So by the time we reached the Karen Kayama building where Hans worked, he was not as familiar as he had seemed at first. He took my arm going up, and I thought, After all, I hardly know this man. Eager as he'd been when a boy, he showed me the fabulous golden books of the JNF, filled with humble and great names, with all who delighted to become redeemers in this way. Here, Rebecca, he said, is the name of Henrietta Soule, the founder of Hadassah. And here, your late president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He said the word, your president, as though I were a stranger. But when he turned to the names of Theodore Hetzel and Shapira, he said our leaders, as though he thought I had no part in them. It was in his office that he asked me not to call him Hans anymore. 
My name is Chaim now, he said. Again, I wasn't really listening, wondering what had become of a little brother I had left in Germany. And then he did a darling thing. Years ago, when we were kids in Germany, if one of us daydreamed in our family, we paid a fine into the blue box. So when he shook that box at me and made me put my nickel in, I thought, Chaim is a better name for you. Chaim. Hebrew for life. Can this blue box somehow be responsible for your new life? It was not until we got to Ramat Hadassah's soul that I realized she was not only my sister. She was also a mother of two children. In this place with its gardens and reception center for youth Aliyah, I could see from the way Rebecca reacted to the youngsters that they were a kind of symbol of the time when I had been a youth Aliyah child. These newest ones also tugged at her heart. Her patience and the ease and the love she showed them recalled the younger sister I had known. I saw my own children and the children of Israel, laughing, swinging, playing. I kept rehearsing what I would say to them at home, how Naklak Hadassah, a name they knew, was really a tract 17,000 dunams big, a place where fine suburbs and settlements now exist. There was Kiryat Bialik, named for the great Hebrew poet, who would have been content to be remembered in this way. Kiryat Metzkin, bearing the name of Herzl's contemporary. Kvar Mazurik, remembering a Czech patriot and friend of Zionism, all making a ring of plenty around industrial Haifa, from which fanned out the roads to Acre and Safad and Nahariya. In Naklak 7, a large strip on the coast which ran up to Israel's north frontier, I rejoiced at the lush fields where young girls worked in the earth with happiness. Young men were harvesting, their scythes moving in the sun, the way they taught our children to move in the dances we gave for JNF in our Hebrew school back home. The work villages designed to solve Israel's triple problem of security, food production, and absorption, interested me immensely. I knew we had pledged to buy 40,000 dunams for 10 such villages, and to reclaim at least 10,000 dunams for cultivation. Vasa Natura, up on the strategic Lebanese border, was the first real frontier post Rebecca ever saw. The guard explained how vitally villages were needed here to bring security along a wild terrain where every day sudden death threatened and often struck the defenders. We ask only to hold the land which is ours by right of purchase, labor, and sacrifice. At Naharia, where so many immigrants from Germany had settled, the sound of the language we spoke as children, the names, the signs in the shops, the little cafe where we went for refreshments made us more easeful together, amused, relaxed for the first time. I told her how I'd been a soldier hereabouts. While you in the United States, I told her, were buying this land right here at Nahrat number five, you didn't know that I was soldiering nearby, did you? They've named it since Mishmar David for David Marcus, the American colonel who came to fight and who died for us.
When we got to the Negev, I proudly told her how 51 villages existed now in what had been a wilderness of sand. There are some 11,000 people living here now, many of them from Yemen, I said. The Gemini Jew who could never own land before takes to farming, to modern techniques. Having always spoken Hebrew, he fits into Israel easily, even into the austerity which is no new experience for him. In Yachini, which is Nachlat number six, I ran out of facts. So I called the children over and told them who Rebecca was. How in America, far away, women like her were glad to give the funds to redeem the land on which they made their settlement. She asked me to tell them how her children also worked for JNF. She said, I'm taking them your greetings. Despite the years of separation, Rebecca acknowledged a bond we shared in this earth, this homeland of our people. Chaim watched and listened, wondering, I think, that I should know so much of Israel. I noticed it at Nafak 3, where, still in the Negev, we walked beside a settler. I noticed his surprise when I said, Americans think helping Israel is for their own self-interest, too, because you, too, are a democracy. I remember well the trip to the Hula. I was happy at first, seeing with my own eyes the swamps I'd often talked about, redeemed by all those hundreds of thousands of Hadassah women. Knock clock eight seemed familiar. The waters parted, Mount Hermon still on guard, the swiftly moving channel cutting back the black and fertile land on either side, creating virgin fields. Then suddenly, checking my joy, there welled up in me a terrible sadness. Why? Why had our parents died before they too could see the return of our people to this land? Why had fate prevented them from living here in the fullness of their age? I blurted out to Hayim how I felt. Now I could tell her freely how I felt. At Kiryat Anavim, the green and lovely Hadassah forest, was a good place to confess how I had also raged for years, doubting God and man because our mother and father were gone. How I had come to know that here the past is not a grave. Working with JNF, I saw the earth as ever renewing life, both for myself and for my people. Back in Jerusalem, Chaim understood the need for welcoming tomorrow. What better symbol than Jerusalem itself, built anew on centuries of sadness? Now new streets, new buildings, new vigor, the new capital of Israel. He told me how he had gone to Ain Kerem, where Hadassah is constructing its new medical center, to be present at the dedication of our forest in memory of Eliezer Kaplan. He recounted how leaders from the JNF and from Hadassah had made pledges for the house of healing that is rising here. How Mrs. Kaplan had unveiled this living monument to her husband. How everyone, the president of Israel included, had pressed a small young tree into the earth as another symbol of our contract with life and hope. The flame in memory of this covenant burned but a little on that hill. When we came later, only the sign remained. But that was as it should be, a promise of green and peaceful shade, not a harking back to death. I knew what we had to do, we too, a brother and a sister, to turn our memory of tragedy into an affirmation and a hope. Chaim and I, 
each carrying a small sapling, went into the forest of the martyrs, there to bind our parents to the earth of Eretz Israel. The forest of the martyrs, where a million trees, 600,000 of them planted by Hadassah, are already beginning to cover the Judean hills. A tree for our mother. A tree for our father. Yet Kadal, the Yet Kadash, Shemay Rabah. Magnified and sanctified be his great name in the world, which he hath created according to his will. May he establish his kingdom during your life, and during your days, and during the life of the whole household of Israel. So say he. Amen. Thus have my brother and I grafted the missing years to each other. Thus he taught me to turn mourning into living. Soon I shall go back to my husband and to our children, bearing as a witness the frail red blossoms which burn more bright than memorial fires they replace upon the hills of Israel. And returning, I shall weep no more.